Welcome everybody. Uh, the healthy building, keeping people happy, healthy and productive. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, an expert panel. Joanna Watchman from uh, founder of Work in Mind. Kat Ringland, Sustainability Associate at BDP. And Simon Jones, who's Head of Air Quality at Ambisense. Thank you very much for your time coming along. So, it's a pretty good assumption that people believe buildings are safe places. Safe places to be, safe places to exist. Most of the time, they are warm, dry, inviting places to be. But the pandemic has raised the profile and importance of ensuring our buildings are not just nice, but in fact, they're infection resilient. There's lots of pretty badges to promote a healthy building that major companies and organisations go after to promote a healthy building in line, in line with, but not just in, again, go after to promote a safe, healthy building in line with not just air quality, but environmental quality too. Do these badges go far enough to ensure our buildings are truly safe places to be? And what about the SMEs of the UK, the ones that the big corporates rely on? How can, how can the Little League ensure they're able to have a safe environment for their teams too? So, an open question. Anybody can pick on that if they like. Um, I would... Is my mic on? Should be on, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd probably say some of the certifications, so the badges... Oh, it depends on the, the type of badge. So, you've got your badges like Briam, which is mainly for environmental sustainability with a bit of health and well-being, but then you've also got things like the well building standard, which is solely um, assessing the impact of the built environment on human health and well-being. I mean, some would say the well building standard probably goes a bit too far um, and is probably a bit too onerous. But I do think with the other certifications, there's a lot more that can be done um, to promote health and well-being. I think delivering healthy and sustainable buildings, those two ideas need to be delivered hand in hand, you can't separate the two out. And I don't currently think that the other certifications are, are addressing that. I think the challenge with um, a lot of these certifications is they're not regulatory or mandatory. Um, some organisations will be driven towards them because of their own ESG agenda. Um, they may be driven them because of internal well-being and health politics of the organisation. Um, there's a, quite a spectrum of... Um, standards and, and um, certifications available to people from Reset to L to Briam to LEED, you know, the list is endless, A-rated. A, a um, there's a number of them and I think there's something for everybody but that people have to choose to do it. Um, and that's one of the big challenges is what, what drives people to want a healthy building. Um, this, this COVID pandemic, I think, has really focused minds on what healthy is from a ventilation perspective and an infection control perspective. Um, but air quality and healthy buildings is so much more than ventilation rates and infection control. As Kath pointed out earlier, um, and as you mentioned, it's everything from light and sound and well-being and, and the light and space, um, and it goes, the list is endless. Um, the challenge with that is that makes it complex and it's a big undertaking. So for a lot of organisations, it's a bit like their sustainability journey. It's a, it's a big rabbit hole to, to fall into uh, and quite a big journey for people to make. You've got to have buy-in throughout organisations. You've got to understand what you're trying to achieve, so that should drive which route you go down. The other problem is, is that things like well are not cheap to do. So there are organisations who are pursuing what they describe as the spirit of well. So it's a bit like saying, well, I'm going to go to uh, Weight Watchers and, uh, well, actually, I probably won't go to Weight Watchers. I'll just stop eating biscuits. Well, it's not, probably not going to kind of get you quite where you need to be. You're not going to get the framework. You're not going to get uh, the support. And, of course, there's a badge at the end of it. I happen to think that the thing that well do really, really well, with a small w, is they're great communicators. They explain things, they produce content, they explain the business case. And, um, you know, if you're going to make a call on, on pursuing one of these routes, 
uh, or you are somebody who is in the specification chain, so you're not the end user, um, I think it's very important that you, you have the, the backup, the materials you need, the information you need to make the case for certification. I know, uh, because I've had a little sneak peek at, uh, at the questions we're going to get asked, but I know we're going to talk about ESG in a minute, but one of the things that the WELL team are doing, uh, the IWBI as I should say, is that they are looking at, is there a letter missing on ESG? Should we have an H for health? ESGH. So um, I know that WELL are really looking hard at bringing in ESG factors into their certification route. So, you know, it's, it's, that's just kind of one, but you know, money is usually behind all these decisions. Well, one, one small additional point I'd make is uh, not to underestimate the power of uh, the lexicon. The, all of this stuff helps introducing the term of healthy buildings into the lexicon of the built environment. We start, you know, nobody understood what parts per million of CO2 meant up until a couple of years ago. Now, people with no interest in air quality understand that a thousand something or other is probably not good. Um, but that's a big step forward to where we were a couple of years ago. And a good analogy for this would be Passive House. You know, Passive House is a trademarked standard of a, of a construction methodology that we see used in the general lexicon of the built environment as we're, we're building to Passive House standards. Now, passive house standards is just a bunch of numbers, 25 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum or whatever other number you choose to, to take. Um, but it's a very powerful driver. Uh, so even if you're not certifying, there is a power to that lexicon that, that may well help over time. It's worth, it's worth thinking about that, I think, because it's, um, a lot of this stuff is language. I don't think any of you answered my question. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> So, as an SME, I run an SME company. We've managed to do the basics, and there's probably people out there that have tried to do it too. So, do you think there's call for a specific standard for smaller enterprises? Because we can't all afford this super duper wowee badge on the door stuff. There is, there is a standard, and it's called the Health and Safety at Work Act. Thank you. And your job is to provide a healthy working environment for your employees. Um, unfortunately, that's about as far as that standard goes, is that woolly, rounded language about health and well-being. Um, but that, that is part of the regulatory and legislative part that all businesses and organisations have to comply with. Um, the, the reality is, and you know, I've said this to you before, Nathan, is when we talk about air quality, we often picture buildings like we're in today. Uh, or an Accenture head office in the city of London with fabulous automation and Schneider controls coming out of every orifice of the building. Um, the reality is the vast majority of the built environment is not like that. As you know, most offices are above shops in a high street. We've got post offices that are out of front people's front rooms. Most restaurants in towns are in basements of turn-of-the-century buildings. There's a huge challenge in dealing with what is... Um, the vast majority of the built environment, the great thing is, is that's where the low-hanging fruit is. Mm. I mean, I can't, I can't disagree with any of it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, I think there, is, there is, most certainly there is a need. But, you know, my, my point about the spirit of is that perhaps the thing to do is to work... It's for SMEs, perhaps even through some of the business organisations, whether it's the FSB, etc. But to try and find ways to pursue the spirit of some of these routes, so that you can take those components and bring them into businesses. But for so many of us, and myself included, you know, you have so little control over your built environment. Um, you know, somebody once said to me that a facilities manager has more influence on your human health than your GP. I mean, that in itself is a scary. <laughs> and for those of us who are not in control of those spaces, we rent or where we you know, run our businesses, it, or if we work, it, it, it's, it's really tough. So I think you've probably opened up a, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity. Anybody able to deliver something for SMEs? It would be a great thing to do. 
is. I personally think it's such a shame that well is so expensive, just even in terms of the certification fees. And we do um, have a lot of clients who come to us and say, you know, we want to develop you know, a new building in the spirit of well. Mm -hmm. With new developments, it never happens, because essentially, you know, con first value engineering exercise that comes on board, it's like everything's out the window. Um, so similar to your comment about the FM team, I think we really need everyone to be on board. You need that, the health and wellbeing agenda to be driven sort of at every level. I'm not sure we have that. So it would be great if we did have a, maybe not a certification for SMEs, maybe like a toolkit, like, um, but it's how do we, I suppose, enforce that, not through building rigs. Mm. We won't go into building rigs okay. and enforcement. We'll park that. <laughs> Okay, got another one. We mentioned ESG, environmental social governance. It seems to be the buzzword of the moment, um, with global capital investments running into the trillions. There's some scepticism. Please, I managed to say that word right, because I couldn't say it for the life of me when I was practicing this one. I'm not going to say it again. Around ESG just being a PR stunt to whitewash or indeed greenwash products or actions as sustainable or environmentally friendly. But in relation to our buildings, how can ESG ensure they are self, uh, safe, healthy and productive places? Well, I mean, I personally, I don't think it's a, a buzzword. I think there is a problem with vocabulary because, you know, for anybody, I mean, and I do this in my other life and I'm not doing work in mine, but for anybody who is around the sustainability space and reporting, you know, we've gone from talking about CSR and we have sustainability and now a lot of organisations are using ESG as the, as the kind of the phrasing. So there is a problem about vocabulary. I don't think it's, it's greenwash, but in, from a building's perspective, the S element, the social element, and if we were to bring in H for health, which I think would be a, a wonderful addition, there are so many things that could be measured and reported on and thought about from a, you know, a, a, a people perspective, a well-being perspective, a, a, you know, a, a wider community perspective, which is also reported on under ESG. My kind of definition of ESG, uh, which is slightly kind of textbooky, is that it is the measurable elements of sustainability. So on that basis, I mean, I'm not an engineer by background, and a lot of people in this room will be, if you can measure something on whether it's building performance, uh, you know, sick days lost or not, um, you know, the fact that you might have made sustainability benefit, you know, improvements, lighting, LED lighting, heating, ventilating, whatever, and that that has also an impact not only on energy but well-being, all those things can be factored in, and I think that should be encouraged. And I applaud the likes of Well, it won't just be them, for discussing this and raising the game on it. I think we're, we're definitely lacking kind of the KPIs, aren't we, and the benchmarks for, for the S, which I think is something that definitely needs addressing a lot more than... Yeah. I, I think there is a... Um, there's an underlying current appearing within ESG that is not visible to most people and that is the asset class. Um, the asset class are a risk-based industry, and they view their assets very much through the lens of ESG at the moment. And they, are made, they make decisions in pension timeframes, which means they are sitting on assets or purchasing assets or trying to move assets in timeframes of 2030 and 2050. And be under no illusions, those organisations, the money that makes the world go round, is starting to ask questions around the specifics of the performance of the built environment. Um, so if you want to access green finance, you need more than a vanilla sustainability report every year now. You need hard numbers and facts about what you're doing around circularity and embodied carbon and you know, scope one, two and, and even three emissions now. Uh, and you see that ref reflected at a European level in the development of the EU taxonomy. And although the EU social taxonomy is stuck a little bit at the moment, it's happening. And, and it's, it, it's a powerful force that when the money starts saying this building is going to be valued in a very different way in five or ten years' time to how it's being valued now, 
things start to happen. I mean, I, I spent Monday this week with a client who I work with on sustainability reporting stuff, and we were going through an ESG, an investor, an investor questionnaire, and there were 150 questions on the questionnaire about different elements of, of ESG, and I cannot tell you how um, much it kind of focuses the brain of, of a business, knowing that the investor market, the, the analysts, the investor analysts want this kind of visibility on so many things and so many elements of, of a business. I think all that stuff around our, you know, our, our built assets is, you know, some of it is already there, but that it, will, it will be more, it, it will come in, in greater uh, quantity. I think the other thing I would say is, is that if you are going to report on something and put a figure in something, then there has to be an apples and apples comparison with somebody else's set of figures, doesn't there? And, and as I say, I'm not an engineer or an architect, but the embodied carbon thing, you know, that is one area I know that is a big, big challenge. But do, you, do you see a possibility for the ESG requirement falling down to the SME in, let's say, tenders and works with these bigger organisations? Because we're scored quite heavily in various different ways, but ESG isn't currently coming into that. Supply chain, isn't it? You know, transparent supply chains. And I work with loads of SMEs, and they are being required as part of, you know, um, you know, procurement stuff to, to, to demonstrate, uh, you know, ESG credentials. They might not call it that, but it, that's what it is. And you look at social value, which is if you're, if you're, you know, if any of you are selling into the public sector. I bet you've all got a headache right now about how do you demonstrate social value. So all these things are going to influence whether or not you are able to, 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 to do business. I think an interesting perspective on this is up until a few years ago, um, the, the point at which you had to deal with ESG generally that happened when you came under the class of non-financial reporting directives, which usually meant you were 100 million turnover or around 500 employees. Um, which took it out, you know, you'd be surprised, actually, in a European context, an SME can still turn over 100 million euros, yeah. right? But the 500 employees is a big threshold. Interestingly now, it, it appears that ESG and CSR is so important within organisations, I would argue now that SMEs would almost be looking at placing that kind of expertise in the organisation at the same time they'd be placing a CFO in the organisation because it's as complex an accounting process mm -hmm. and as critical to their business success and future as having decent CFO Absolutely. within the structure. And so I think if you, once you're breaking five or six million turnover and you're starting to think seriously about long-term business accounting, if ESG and CSR isn't part of that process, you're running a risk as a business. So it's, it's just another mechanism that's going to make people think. And with, within that ESG is buried health and well-being and impacts on society. So it's there. Brilliant. Um, Simon, straight for you this one. So you're well versed in the world of ventilation and air quality. Have you seen a shift in the way people engage with you in terms of people's health rather than, say, thermal comfort? And how can technology make uh, people safe in buildings? Um, short answer is yes. I've seen two big shifts in the last five years. I've seen ever tightening regulation and control uh, throughout Europe. Um, there's a recognition, there's a performance gap in how our buildings perform compared to how they were regulated for. And at a European level, we start to see things like uh, individual certification of ventilation systems starting to appear in different countries. We don't have it here in the UK yet, but in Ireland, for example, where I live, every ventilation system uh, in any new building has to be inspected by a third-party independent inspector in order to be sold. And that's, that's it. Is, is that at the time of handover or is it a period after? At the time of handover. In France, for critical systems, uh, building inspectors are able to gain access to buildings up to six years post-occupation to test if the ventilation system is compliant. Uh, other critical systems would be fire safety, balcony safety, and a number of other things. In the Benelux, there's a similar certification scheme on ventilation. 
So we've seen a concentration of minds, people recognising that there, there are loopholes being closed that have really framed the questioning in the last half a decade, I would say. I think from this point onwards, the biggest change I see is the proliferation of sensors into buildings. We are starting to see in real time, for the first time, the performance of our buildings on an ongoing basis, and that changes everything, because you will live and die as a business, or a designer, or an occupier of a building on the ongoing day-to-day -day performance of that space. And that's never really been possible with air quality. And the technology is advancing at such a rate now that what was not possible literally five years ago is starting to become possible now, either because of communication technology or the reduction in cost of sensors. It's moving incredibly quickly. And I think that changes the landscape for everybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you said your building was compliant at handover. It doesn't, say, it doesn't matter if you say your brand does X or Y. If someone's got a screen and it says no, you've got a problem. Uh, and you, you only have to be let down by a brand once and you won't use them again. So I think there's some shifts coming in that market. Renna Kat, anything to add on that one? Uh, clients <laughs> I mean to you at all? No? <laughs> I suppose the only, I guess what you're touching on is kind of obviously post-occupancy performance. Um, and as well as technology, we are seeing the emergence of schemes such as Neighbours, um, which are becoming a lot more, uh, is becoming a lot more popular, where is it every year or every three years, you have to demonstrate that your building is still operating as designed to prevent issues like, you know, poor air quality creeping in. Um, but yeah, hopefully things continue to... Well, I don't want to say more popular, that sounds yeah. wrong, but okay. you know what I mean. <laughs> just want to open up for everybody else if you've got any questions I've got a few more lined up but it's always good to get a bit of questions from the audience has anybody got anything at all? no shy fans the next one's quite a monologue so you might have to bear with me I might have to repeat this one yeah um, they're quiet because it's beers and takeaway after yeah this. I know I know so um, right now it's said to be once in a generation chance to accelerate change and truly address our environmental issues we need change at a biblical scale if we were to achieve our net zero targets. We see Generation Z pursuing careers focused on addressing climate change. Young activists such as Greta Thunberg at just 15 created a stronger call to action on climate change across the world than any politicians before her. People are taking to their feet and refusing to return to the office, adopting for remote or a hybrid way of working, a more balanced uh, way of life, a healthier lifestyle, one that offers huge reductions in pollution and energy consumption. With buildings and building construction sectors combined responsible for 30% of global energy consumption and 80% of existing buildings estimated to be in use by 2050, where is the renovation wave? Where is the joined up thinking to retrofit our existing buildings into safe havens? Places future generations will be happy to work in healthy whilst they're there and truly carbon neutral or are we just carrying on as normal so it's a big one hey, that's, that's quite a big question <laughs> i think it's the question everyone's asking aren't they are we carrying on as normal i don't think we are carrying on as normal i think bodies like you know the uk gbc have started to look at um refurbishments and regenerate uh, yeah refurbishments rather than just new builds but because it's so much easier to establish a route to net zero for new builds, that's where the, um, the focus has been. I do think, and it, it's really slow, but we are as an industry, I don't think we've ever not appreciated the importance of it, and we've understood the scale of it, it's just that we still, I guess we still don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> Nothing's quite properly tried and tested yet. Um, See, so yeah, I agree that the issue is massive, but progress is slow. But I, don't think we are carrying well I hope not anyway. Okay. You, you, you give a technical answer on that. <laughs> um, a couple of points spring to mind. One is that we tend through human nature to view our life through the lens of the moment. Um, we've had two years of a pandemic, we're just about to go into one and possibly several years of an energy crisis. 
um, extreme cases make bad law often, as you know, um, but they do change society. And, and I think certainly the last two years has opened people up to the health of the built environment more than it ever has done. And it almost certainly is going to be true that the next, this next winter is going to remind people how vulnerable we are in our built environment to fuel crises. Um, all of those play into moving towards net zero and thinking about our built environment more closely. The second point I wanted to make, and, and perhaps it's probably one of the biggest frontiers we face, um, whether it's through the workplace or our homes, is this incredible shift in how we work. Um, we've moved from a state now where, where you hear analogies from workplaces of half the space, twice the experience, to try and describe the fact that they've just cut their floor space by half because nobody comes to work anymore. Um, a recent study in Ireland uh, that looked at current work practices suggested something like 60% of people are going to be permanently working in a hybrid model, 30% permanently at home, and just 8% of people in Ireland uh, plan long-term to working full-time at work. In the US, it's something like 68 million people will not return to work um, since the pandemic. Um, the feedback from people, though, is that the overwhelming number of people think it's good for their health and well-being to work from home and good for their mental health, which I think a lot of us can relate to. But as you know, Nathan, our home is where there's the most non-compliance in our built environment. The, the last study conducted by Bayes showed that 95% of the buildings did not comply with the minimum standards of the building regulations. So if you just think about that for a moment, we could have more than three quarters of our workforce working in, in an uncontrolled, virtually unregulated Wild West of an environment. And we heard from Kath Noakes earlier the impact on performance that has. So we now are in this position where vast swathes of our workforce are working in suboptimal conditions. That will have a cost on business. It'll be very hard to spot, but it will have a cost. Wow. Well, I, I wish I was in the audience, actually, because I could have yeah. legitimately written that down and thought, I'll come back to it. Um, I mean, I'm an optimist. Um, I think, you know, you can't, necessity is the mother of invention, which is really what Simon was saying. We can't be as we were. Uh, I think things are changing. I mean, REBA is another organisation, the Royal Institute of British Architects. It's very pro-retrofit, isn't it? Um, but, you know, we have major issues in the built environment around energy efficiency, don't we? I mean, the MEES uh, minimum energy efficiency standards that come in next year. I read um, some Savile's data the other day that said that 185 million square foot of just retail space in the UK would not meet the MEES legislation when it came into impact in, I think it's February next year, but you can correct me on that. I mean, it's phenomenal. That's just one sector. So there is so much to be done to make buildings healthier but concurrently, you know, that has to be about, um, you know, the, the energy challenges as well. But I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. We cannot, we cannot um, keep going as we were because there ain't, there ain't what there was to start with, is there, in terms of the natural resource. So I think we've all got to be positive and I think we should all do our bit um, and double down on doing our bit as well. We should end by remembering World Ventilate Day, Nathan, perhaps. Yes, and thank you for the shameless that plug. That's a good, a, good, a good segue. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you didn't notice that one, if you weren't a part of Kath uh talk, World Ventilation Day, 8th of November. Everything positive about ventilation, people around it, uh, applications, anything, in, anything relating to it. But as Kath said, I think use it as a, as a marketing ploy, but not too much. So feel free to peel for the images and stuff. Mm -hmm put it away uh, and get involved. I've got one last question and then we're going to wrap up So I think we're out of time. Um, what makes you happy in a building? <laughs> um, what makes me happy in a building? I would say biophilic in contact with nature, lots of plants. Over there. Yeah, a good, I think lots of daylight and a good view and that really is exactly the same point about biophilic. Uh, human contact for me. You know, I think buildings are a place for people. 
Um, so I'm always at my happiest when I'm around people in the built environment, uh, especially when there's beers and takeaway. <laughs> Hopefully next. <laughs> Hopefully next, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much.